Good morning. It's good to be back. It's good to be with you. If this is your first time being online with us, well, thank you and God bless you. We have an expression I say every morning when we worship together that newcomers in our midst are none other than Jesus in disguise. You come to bring us blessings. Thank you. I would remind us that the easiest way to extend the circle of our worship and the love we share here is by going to the corner of your Facebook and sharing that you're watching this. Thanks. So I hope you have with you today a candle and some bread and a cup of grape juice or something like it because we're celebrating Holy Communion in a little while. But first we're going to light our candle and as we do, we quiet ourselves and recognize that we are setting aside this time as a special sacred time to commune with our God. Would you join me now in the call to worship? Holy One, dwell within us. Whisper in our ears. Glimmer in our vision. We wait. With open ears, open eyes, open hearts. Amen. Our opening hymn is Gather Us In. We're singing two verses. And no matter the powers of death and darkness that have had a grip on you this week, we have gathered together in the name of Jesus so that we can be set free. I declare to you that your sins are forgiven. A place is prepared for you in the kingdom of heaven, the great circle of God's love. Nothing can separate you from this love that is so deep, wide, we can't measure it. And so let us rejoice in this good news and sing together the song of Alleluia. Alleluia.
peace of Christ is in our very midst, bringing down the walls that separate us from God, from one another, from our truest self. The peace is among us, and let us claim it. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And now it is our time to share with the children. Jesus had a close friend named John. It was John who baptized Jesus that time when the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And Jesus heard the voice of God say, You are my beloved child, in whom I am well pleased. John was what is called a prophet, which in the Bible is somebody who tells kings and other powerful people when they aren't being the good leaders God wants them to be, when they are treating their people unfairly, especially the little people who don't have any power. So John told the king who ruled in those parts, King Herod, that he was doing some evil things that hurt people. And for telling the king the truth, Herod had John arrested and thrown in jail, where eventually he was killed. When word got back to Jesus about what Herod had done to his friend John, well, it made Jesus sad. And Marissa, get us started with the story of what happened next. Well, Pastor Jeff, when Jesus heard what had happened to his friend John, he wanted to be alone. So taking his disciples with him, Jesus went in a boat to a quiet place. But the crowds heard about this, and they followed Jesus on foot from the town. There probably weren't any roads to walk on. Oh, how they wanted to be with Jesus. When Jesus came ashore, he saw a very large crowd. Jesus felt compassion for them. They were probably also sad that John had died. Jesus healed their sick people. When it was almost evening, the disciples came to him. Jesus, there's nothing here. It's already getting late. Send the crowds they away. Go and buy some food in the villages. Jesus replied. Hey, you don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. We only have five. They answered. When the gospel writer John tells the story, he adds an interesting little detail. Conrad and Maya, please tell us about it. It was Andrew, son of Peter's brother. He said, Here is a boy with five small loaves of barley bread. also has two small fish. Well, where will I go in such a large crowd? Not very far. Not very far at all. John has a little kid be the hero of the story. Right, Catherine. The story continues with Jesus calling for the small bit of food to be brought to him. Bring them here to me. He said. Then Jesus directed the people to sit down on their grass. Jesus took the five loaves and... The people. All of them ate and were satisfied. The disciples picked up twelve baskets of leftover pieces. There were well over five thousand people who had enough to eat that day. Everybody shared what they had. Everybody went without. Jesus invites everybody into the circle. Amazing grace. That's what that was. Unforgettable. Stupendous. You got that right, Nikki. That was downright astonishing. Glory, glory, hallelujah. I've never seen anything like it. It's amazing what sharing a little bread will do. 
In a little while, we'll be sharing bread as well when we celebrate together apart Holy Communion. This bread reminds us of Jesus who feeds all of us to overflowing abundance and grace of love. When the first disciples got together, they did as Jesus said. They had a meal together and, a, and then they celebrated Holy Communion, the bread and the cup that remind them of how Jesus shared his whole self with them. And they were reminded of this story we just heard. Of that time Jesus took the bread and shared it and all were fed. It's amazing what a little can do. If you're like me, sometimes you wonder, do I have anything much to offer to this world? Jesus looks at you and me and says, the little you think you have, I can bless it and I can bless the world with it. There is grace overflowing and God wants to use you with what you have if you will only trust God and share your gifts. God's love is so big, which John, RJ, and Amber is the reason why at the end of our time together, we always say, there's always room in the circle. Now it's time for our anthem as our own Barbara will offer up an anthem to the glory of God and to our blessing.
bright enough joy, joy. for all the world. And there's quite enough hope and quite enough power to chase away an eagle. For Jesus. It's good to be back. As most of you know, I've been away for the month of July for some much needed rest and renewal. I want to thank so many people who carried on the ministry of worship here at Parsippany United Methodist Church. I want to thank Steve and Fred for leading worship. I want to thank Tracy for her wonderful children's sermons that challenged us to see beyond the superficial things that keep us separated like the color of our skin and to truly open our hearts and minds to other people. I want to thank our guests, our, our speakers who shared stories and reflections on scripture and challenged us to trust God and to love God and to serve God for Kayla and Katie and Mayor Michael and for Mady. And I want to thank the regular folks, Barb, Connie, Daryl, and Terry, who are here in support roles every Sunday. And I want to thank Cassie Kogan, who for the whole month of July ran our online presence. It's a lot of work. So thank you all. I really appreciate it. And also, thanks to Marissa, who is here filling in as the camera person. I was touched by a story that Mady shared in her testimony last week, which was about when she uh, was born prematurely and the doctors diagnosed a, a hole in her heart and her mother got very sick with lupus and some people from her church came and prayed over both of them. And the next day, to the doctor's amazement, the little hole in the heart had disappeared and Mady's mom's lupus went into remission for 16 years. It's helpful to hear those kinds of testimonies to the power of prayer, which is what we are about to engage in. Mady's still, still struggling and suffering today, I believe, yet with kidney stones. But prayer is powerful. And let us open our hearts and minds now to be together in prayer.
Thank you, O oh God, for that deep stillness that awaits for us when we return to our true home, to your love that is deeper and wider and broader than we can measure, for your love that offers us new beginnings with each breath. We thank you for the capacity as we return to our true center to see, as the song says, what truly matters. And as we do, we experience gratitude arising within us. We begin to appreciate once again all the ways we have been blessed. We thank you for the beauty of this earth. We thank you for music that stirs our hearts, that allows us to catch a glimpse of your eternal love. We thank you for laughter and also for the tears that bring healing. We thank you for so much love shared, for all the little acts of kindness and mercy that we have experienced and that we have been moved by your spirit to share with others. We thank you for forgiveness and for support in our times of darkness. We thank you for food to eat and that network of people who we take for granted who make it possible for us to have food on our table and for your grace and mercy that allows plants to grow. We thank you for bravery in all its many expressions, for the medical staff that continue to serve so faithfully in spite of the dangers. We thank you for those who speak out for prophetic witness. We thank you for police officers who faithfully fulfill their difficult calling to serve our communities. We thank you for opening our hearts to all the deeper meanings of love. We thank you for the life of Congressman John Lewis, whose story contains such bravery, a freedom rider, a bridge crosser, and one dedicated to peaceful witness to justice. We thank you for the ministry of our church and for the ways in which we are able to support one another in the midst of the challenges of this particular time. Lord, in your goodness, hear our prayers. Tim Tyler shares that it is a joy mixed with a sorrow to have found a buyer for Greg and Susan's house. Barbara and Jim Simmons are thankful for four healthy grandchildren. Karen to Christopher is thankful for her family and another day. We thank you, O oh God, for these gifts and for more than we can acknowledge or recognize. It is so easy for us to take our blessings for granted. And we thank you for your spirit that would awaken us to recognize the abundance of your grace. That there is more possibilities for healing and hope and reconciliation and the feeding of the poor in our midst as that story tells us than we are willing to acknowledge. We would come before you, O oh Lord, in the recognition that we are a broken people and that each of us has places within our lives where we struggle with the powers of death and darkness. Each of us has places where 
we are perhaps tempted to despair or hold on to anger or to feel a sense of apathy and a loss of enthusiasm. You know the things, O oh Lord, that block our hearts and minds. You know the things that keep us awake at night. And in this moment of stillness, we would ask once more for your spirit to descend upon each of us, to minister to us at that place of our deepest need. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to us in our need. Thank you for setting us free from that prison cell that is our ego, that we might feel your compassion for this broken world and those who are hurting. We thank you for the gift of prayer and we confess to you that we do not understand prayer and we know that often what we ask for is not what we get, but there is a mystery in which you move in our prayers to bless in ways beyond our understanding. And so we would raise up into your arms persons that you've placed upon our hearts and the needs that each of us brings. We pray for Ruth Fallon, 93 years old, who is in hospice care in Allentown, where she went with Charles to be with their son. Be with Ruth as she prepares to come into your eternal light and comfort Charles as he begins to let go of his bride of over 70 years. We pay, pray for Pat Wentz's son, Jimmy, who is dealing with a blood clot in his lung that needs to dissolve. We pray for Carol Treza, dealing with a mass in her abdominal tract. Heal her and comfort her and her daughter, Gina. We pray for our brother, Wes Sitgreaves, who is scheduled for surgery on August 11th to have a kidney removed because of a tumor that's been detected. Bless him and Elda. We pray for David Kensley's sister-in-law, Ula, who has having some complicated surgery tomorrow. We pray for Anna and Barbara's friend, Claire, whose husband, Norm, Norman took a fall that left him paralyzed. Bless the doctors who are now attending to him. Bless Claire. Allow them to feel your presence. We pray for Mady, who continues to experience bouts of severe pain as she seeks to pass a kidney stone. We pray for Joanne and Greg's friend, Joey who is in the hospital with some serious complications after a dog bite. We pray for June Snetzer's mom and John Snetzer's grandmother with dementia, recovering from hip surgery in Troy Hill Center. We pray for Diane Anastasi, who will have knee replacement surgery this Wednesday. Bless her and lead her safely into healing. We pray for Arlene's close Uncle John with colon cancer and for his disabled wife Maria and their children Lisa and Johnny as they care for them. We pray for Joanne's friend Car Carolyn dealing with colon cancer. We pray for all those who are battling COVID-19 and we ask that you would give us the grace to be mindful of those around us. Help us to live safely for one another. 
We pray for the medical staff on the front lines of this pandemic, and especially in those places where the infection rates are climbing and the hospitals are in danger of being overwhelmed. We pray for those we know who are part of these medical teams, for Wa's daughter Esther and Anna Igorova and Sharon Coughlin and Christina Imodi and Bill Atkinson and Tracy's cousin Debbie. We pray for people living in group homes and nursing homes like Brian Bramley's brother Tommy and TJ and Michael Krissa and Amy Deek's mother and Dawn Kimmel's dad and Anna's mother, Muriel, and her friend, Virginia, and for our beloved, Diane Morgan. We pray for Garrett's brother-in-law, the Reverend James Brassard, and his wife, Andrea. We pray for our brother, Bob Crissa, dealing with severe pain from a fractured vertebrae and ask for his healing. We pray for Susan's sister, Helen, with dementia and her husband, Maurice. We pray for June Blake and Lynn Boswick, for Fred Schlossauer, for Fred Mendez's mother, for Ann Saunders, for Amina, Cotty, and Cheryl, and Cheryl's sister, sister Susan, on dialysis. We pray for Angela Nolan in Nova Scotia, who is in need of heart surgery. Pray for Grace Ager and Wa and Betsy and Doris. We pray for Paul, Paul's parents and Renee's mom and her cousin Bob. We pray for Eric Cristiango's mother who is in failing health on dialysis. We pray for Betsy O'Grady's dad and Jim Simmons. Lincoln and Terry. We pray for all who have weakened immune systems that they may be blessed, strengthened, led to your restoring waters. We pray for all those who are in the valley of the shadow, especially those who are dying alone. Let your light encompass them. We pray for families under stress in this ongoing pandemic. And we pray for the children and the teachers and the challenges of school as, it, as they work out ways to hold school in the fall. We pray for people, many people, struggling with depression, with intense loneliness, we pray for those who have lost jobs and businesses, for those losing homes, for those who feel a sense of terror as they look to the future. We pray for all who are grieving, for Connie, for Anna and Barbara's friend Kate with the death of her beloved 11-year-old daughter Katie of a blood disorder. We pray for the healing and the reconciliation of our broken society. We pray for a greater capacity to listen to and care about the struggles of others, to listen to and hear what others have to say, even when we passionately disagree. We pray for justice, and racial reconciliation. We pray for all who live in the fear of violence, and we pray for the willingness of all of us to learn the things that make for peace. We pray for people in positions of authority making decisions that affect many, hard decisions. We ask that they might be led by your spirit, granted your wisdom, empowered to faithfully carry out their responsibilities. 
we pray for our own Michael, Mayor Michael Soriano, who leads our town. We pray for the little ones all over the world who are suffering in ways that are perhaps beyond our comprehension. The homeless, those who are starving, those who are refugees seeking a place of welcome and rest. Lord, in your mercy, Barbara Simmons asks for prayers for peace around the world. Anna Weiss asks prayers for Steve's aunt, Sue, who is also a friend of mine from high school, who is undergoing chemo and radiation. Betsy asks prayers. Um, she rolled her ankle, and she sees the orthopedic surgeon tomorrow. Jean Sakalakis asks for prayers tomorrow as she finally goes through her second cataract surgery. Mady asks prayers for her neighbor, Vic, who has spinal damage in his neck from getting knocked down by a wave two weeks ago down the shore. He has already undergone two surgeries and is still in slow recovery. Tim asks prayers for those in distress over making ends meet day to day as the virus in our economy threatens so many. Karen De Christopher asks prayers for her recent heart and kidney issues that they can be resolved completely and safely. Carolyn asks prayers for her uncle Bob's continued healing from hip surgery as he also has COPD and has difficulty breathing. He's 80 and has not been doing well. Joanne shares an update about um, the boy Joey who was hit bitten by the dog. He's out of the hospital and is on his way to recovery. Prayers for continued healing. Media asks prayers for those who are spewing hate on social media and for God's love to hold them and melt their hardened hearts. Prayers that we as Christians can show with our actions the love of Jesus. Thank you, O oh Lord, that you are at work in this world in ways we cannot see that it is your intention to bring us to a deeper wholeness, both personally and as a society. We pray, O oh Lord, for each of us that we may walk more intentionally with you, that we may humble our hearts, that we might choose the hard way of love, we would hear your call to love even those we would name as enemies. We ask your spirit be poured out upon our church that we may truly be witnesses to your good news of a grace and a love that is that nothing can separate us from. And now we would pray together those words who the one we follow taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
passage at least 40 times. And I'm always amazed, largely depending on the new place that I'm coming from, how I can hear new insights, receive new guidance from God from the story. What caught my attention this time as I read this story, one of the things was that the story begins with Jesus feeling sad. And he has good reason to feel sad because he's grieving. He is grieving for his friend and mentor, John. And he's grieving for this whole world that suffers under injustice and violence and cruelty. And he's grieving perhaps even for his own life, knowing that the same fate that came to John when he was killed by Herod will come to himself as well. He is feeling sad. Now, we are tempted to think of sadness as a bad thing. And our inclination often is when we have sadness to arise within us uh, to try to distract ourselves and get busy so we don't feel the sadness. And that's understandable and sometimes it's necessary. But what's striking here in this story is that Jesus, in his sadness doesn't get busier. He chooses to go apart by himself for the specific purpose, I believe, to feel his sadness, his grief. Now, sadness of grief is not a bad thing. Grief is a sign of love. You do not grieve if you don't love. It's the price of love. And to close our hearts down so that we don't have to grieve is to die in a way that is actually pretty horrible. Jesus chooses to go and experience his sadness, trusting, as it says in Psalm 30, that weeping may tarry through the night, but joy comes in the morning, that sadness is here in this present moment. But sadness is not the only emotion, and it will pass to joy in time, but it needs to be experienced. And so he goes in a, a, boat, a sailboat with his disciples, and as I imagine that that boat ride was probably a couple of hours as they went along the coast seeking out a place they knew that was quiet, and I imagine that that sailboat ride was healing for Jesus' soul as he just sat there in silence, the disciples also in silence as he thought about John and felt the sadness, but felt the presence of Abba. And then they get to the place, and as they come ashore, well, lo and behold, where they anticipated having more time for solitude, there's a whole crowd of people, 5,000 people who have fallen along the shore, and I suspect the disciples were not happy about that a bit. But the remarkable thing about Jesus is his capacity to shift in that moment from the time on the sailboat, being with his grief, to turning his attention now to the crowd. And in fact, I think there was a connection between his ability to enter into his grief and what the gospel writer tells us, which is that he felt compassion upon the people. His pain allowed him to recognize and feel the pain of the crowds. He doesn't cling to that time of solitude, but lets it go and now opens himself to what the present happens. You know, there's that expression, plans, uh, we, we, we make plans and uh, life happens. Yeah, there's a couple of different expressions. We plan, God laughs, life's what, happen, life's what happens when we make plans. You know what I mean. Our plans are interrupted constantly. But the striking thing for me about Jesus here is he's so easily and gracefully able to shift into what the new moment brings him. And he walks around the crowd, spending several hours attending individually, 
with all of the sick who are in the crowd. There are certain people who have this capacity to be fully present in the moment with whoever they are with in a way that moves people. Fred Rogers was described as being like that. Mother Teresa, the Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela. They, they, would, they would be with people without being in a sense of rush at all, and the person would feel like, at this moment, I'm the most important person for this person. And that's the quality I imagine Jesus having that afternoon, no sense of rush as he moved from person to person, giving them his full attention and his healing presence in their lives. And his spirit became contagious for the great crowd of people and something shifted within them. The disciples, however, are preoccupied with time. There are two words in Greek that talk about time. One is chronos, chronology. It's linear time. It's one moment after another. That's our usual way of thinking of time. And they're preoccupied by time. We have our watches that keep our lives ordered. For the disciples, it would have been watching the sun move across the sky. And they would have seen, uh-oh, it's going to be dark in a couple of hours. And they got anxious. They began to think about all the things that might happen. And they can't be in the present moment like Jesus. And they get anxious. And they think about what needs to be resolved. And they come to him and say, Jesus, send the people away. They, they, don't, they haven't brought food and Jesus doesn't succumb to their anxiety. He simply looks in them in the eyes and says, you give them something to eat. They have, of course, just five loaves of bread and two fish. What good can that do? But Jesus senses that there's another kind of time present, and that other Greek word for time is kairos. Now, kairos, in contrast to chronos, speaks about deep time. It's about this moment where suddenly something shifts and we are connected to eternity. And he recognizes that something has happened in the course of that afternoon that they have been entering into Kairos time. Jesus came proclaiming that the kingdom of heaven is at hand, that it's breaking into the world, and he knew that this was such a moment. And so he takes the bread, he gives thanks. Where the disciples see scarcity, he sees abundance. He breaks the bread and has the disciples begin to pass out the bread and the fish. And I think what happened was that there was this spontaneous out pouring of sharing, and that those who had brought something brought it forth. Usually we think about this story as being a supernatural miracle, and that's understandable. But I've always been inclined to think that it's not that kind of miracle, because that's not really how Jesus worked. And you might remember in that story about Jesus out in the wilderness with the devil, he offered him the power to turn the stone into bread, and he turned that down. That's not the usual way that Jesus works. He invites us to be a part of the miracles. And so it was shared, this wonderful sense of sharing, and 5,000 people sitting on that green grass felt this wonderful sense of nourishment, not just of their bodies, but of their souls, of being deeply connected with one another. What they were experiencing at that moment was the kingdom of heaven breaking into this world. They caught a glimpse of it, and it was transformative. It was beautiful. So that's how I heard the story this time. I went on vacation a month ago, as you know, and I had been working pretty straight for six, seven months, six months. And I was feeling pretty worn down and exhausted. And it wasn't so much physical fatigue as it was a sense of spiritual fatigue. 
looking back now, I recognize that one way to express what had happened to me was that I had lost the present moment. That I was in this state of mind where all I'm thinking about is the next thing, the next thing that needs to happen, and I wasn't able to be fully in the present because it is in the present where we encounter God. For the first two weeks of my vacation, I didn't quite know what to do with myself. I, it was as if I said to myself, uh, Jeff, who are you if you're not working and getting stuff accomplished? And so I found things to do. I cleaned my garage, which really needed it, and I cleaned my office, which really needed it, and went through my files, and I put pictures up on the walls, all good things to do. But I began to realize that it wasn't so much the external chaos that was my problem, it was my internal chaos. And gradually, I began to spend more and more time just sitting in silence with what's called contemplative prayer, or meditation, being in stillness, and gradually finding myself to begin to live a little bit more like how Jesus lived that afternoon, able to embrace the moment, whatever it is the bro moment brings. I'm on a journey. It, it's not done. I've got a ways to go. But that is what we're called to be about. We're called to be present to the moment not to be led by our anxieties, but to be led by this sense of presence that allows us to be the embodiment of love, to be a peace, peaceful presence, a non-anxious presence in a troubled and chaotic world that we might somehow spring an impact upon all the destructive forces because we are witnessing to the love of God that is present in this moment right now. Always present beyond all those other things. I invite you to join me in this journey to trying to faithfully be present to Jesus and to one another and to your deepest self. Please pray with me. How easy it is for us, O oh Lord, to become anxious and troubled about many, many things. But you are here as near as our next breath. Help us return to you in each breath. Help us to be not anxious about tomorrow, but to simply focus on what is before us in this moment. To open our hearts fully. To not be afraid of our grief, but allow us to trust that we will move through this moment by moment through times of darkness into light, that we really don't need to be afraid, that you are a gracious God who provides for our needs, that you are a gracious God who is making possibilities and opportunities that we are too closed down now to even imagine. Help us to trust you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please join me as we sing Spirit of the Living God.
So this is an unusual way to celebrate Holy Communion. Holy Communion is intended to be shared in person, all together. But we adjust to what the moment presents us with, and we can share Holy Communion from a distance. I hope that you have some bread and some juice. And if you are a family watching, designate one person who will fill in to play the part of Jesus to speak. And we will share communion, that deep communion, together from a distance. All are invited. There's room in the circle. You don't have to have your belief system all worked out. Really, all you need is a humble heart willing to receive a gift. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. From the earth you bring forth bread and create the fruit of the vine and make covenant to be our sovereign God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and gave grapes as evidence of the promised land. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. When we had turned aside from your way and abused your gifts, you gave us, Jesus, your crowning gift. Emptying himself that our joy might be full, he fed the hungry, healed the sick, ate with the scorned and forgotten, washed his disciples' feet, and gave us a holy meal as a pledge of his abiding presence. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which Jesus gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat this, this is my body which is given for you. And after the supper was over, he took the cup. And again, he gave thanks. And he gave the cup to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood poured out for the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. And now I would invite you at home to take the bread and please repeat after me. God, we thank you for Jesus. God, we thank you for Jesus. Who was broken. Who was broken. That we might be one. I invite you now to take the cup. God, we thank you for Jesus. God, we thank you for Jesus. Who gave us his life. Who gave us his life. 
that we might have life. I invite you at home to place your hands in a posture of blessing and open yourself to the Spirit of God. Pour out your Holy Spirit on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. the body of Christ broken for you. I invite you to begin with the bread. And the blood of Christ shed for you. I invite you to take the bread and dip it in the cup and receive the gift. Serve one another as Christ served his disciples. You can continue to serve one another and we will Sing two verses of Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Now join me, please, in the prayer of thanksgiving. <clears throat> you have given yourself to us, Lord. Now we give ourselves for others. You have raised us with Christ and made us a new people. As people of the resurrection, we will serve you with joy. Your glory has filled our hearts. Help us to glorify you in all things. Amen. Amen. And before we proceed to the benediction, we pause for announcements. We can't have coffee hour in person hosted by Tom and Catherine, but we can have it on Zoom. And shortly after the worship service, I will open the meeting and we can commune together through Zoom. There also will be multiple Zoom opportunities through the week there are people who will continue to have just simple gatherings, but I'm offering something new on Tuesday and Wednesdays at noon, and that's going to be a meditation with Pastor Jeff. Uh, I will talk about contemplative prayer and lead us in, in exercises that allow us to enter into a deeper sense of restfulness and prayer and connection to God. And I 
I invite you to join me for that. We have other opportunities to connect online. This Wednesday, the United Methodist Women will have their Bible study led by Betsy Adams. I will be leading Bible study on Thursdays during the month of August at 7.30. The Administrative Council is going to be meeting, however, on Thursday, August 20th at 7 p.m. In the meantime, I would invite you all to ponder the question, what are your feelings about beginning in, to have socially distanced in-person worship? And to share those thoughts as we consider what to do as we move forward as a church. We have a historian in our midst. Our own Tim Tyler, you may not be aware, has a master's degree in history. And I invited Tim two months ago to teach a course on Zoom about the history of race relations in America and how we got to the place where we find ourselves today. I'm hoping this will be something that people across the political spectrum will join together in learning things that Tim has to teach us about stories of history we may not know and then allow us to engage in constructive conversation as a people of faith. That will happen on Wednesdays, beginning on the 12th. He has six sessions. He'll take a break next month for the first Sunday when the UMW meet. The sessions will be no, will be less than an hour. There is an ongoing group led by Penny and Anna on the book, Women, Food, and God. If you'd like to be a part of that, it meets on Tuesdays, uh, the second and fourth Tuesdays. Fred's 20 Touchstones is also continuing to meet in person on Monday and Thursday, socially distanced at the church. And I need to remind you, it is all the more clear that it is important that our church be here in the midst of this broken world to witness to the love that is revealed in Jesus that our common ministry is very important, and we need your support. If you have been thrown by this, uh, the economic threat of this pandemic and have lost your job, don't worry about trying to keep your pledge going. That's fine. But if you're one of the people, like myself, who has not lost our jobs, then consider perhaps being even more generous with your pledge, that we might together continue our, our strong witness in our community to the love of Jesus. Again, we want to connect people who have compromised immune systems, who really shouldn't be out in public shopping, with people who are willing to shop for them, let us know. There are volunteers needed for the township's Friday food drop. You can get in touch and offer your services. And on the 22nd, we are actually continuing our, take our turn with interfaith furnishings, moving furniture. Uh, though we won't be going in people's houses, we welcome volunteers to serve that morning. And that brings us to the benediction. Allow us, O oh Lord, as we go forth from this worship service to trust in your presence with us in each moment that you are here to provide for our deepest needs and that you are calling us to live fully and abundantly with love and hope and peace, to bear witness to God's mercy in this troubled world. Go in peace to serve the Lord. Amen. Go now in peace.